Hey guys, I got a super awesome show for you today. I am talking with professors Lynn Martin and Robin DeHaas, the founders of the MDH Breathing Coordination Method. These two people are brilliant, uh, very passionate about the design of breath, full of wisdom and knowledge, and they just love teaching people how we are designed to breathe. I think you're really gonna love this show, super informative. You might wanna get a pen and paper and take some notes. Anyway, thanks so much for listening. Enjoy the show. Pull up a chair and buckle up. It's the Original Strength Podcast. You guys, uh, Robin and Lynn, you, you created something called MDH Breathing Coordination um, based off of the work, work of Carl Stahl. What is, if you could paraphrase it and give us a good summary, what is MDH Breathing Coordination? It is a, uh, an organization that has been evolving to both cherish and carry forward work that Carl Stow did roughly from 1965, around that period, up till his death in the year 2000. Um, I studied with Carl Stow since 1975 until 2000. Uh, he never established a training program of his work in his lifetime. Uh, so when I met Robin, I think it was 2005 or 2006, right in that period, um, as we became friends and worked together for a whole summer here in New York while he was studying special voice projects. Um, as he was departing from my small apartment, standing at the doorway, and he looked back and he said, if you would come, if you, would you come to Switzerland if I made a workshop there? And I said, oh, sure, you know. And I thought, well, I'll never hear from this young man again. And sure enough, a few months later, the email came, the workshop is ready, when will you be here? was more or less the message that came. And we've been planning that ever since. So if I could be bold enough just to say, maybe this would be my opening thought, um, that we wanted to uh, build upon the work that Carl Stow did, studying it together, uh, add to it wonderful uh, additional work about working with the voice and breathing and turning it into a, a body of organized material information that could be taught to other people, either individuals, for example, people who might wish to ultimately teach this work themselves and or general students who wanted to have knowledge of this work for their own personal use. And we just wanted to make it more open and more available to people by forming workshop possibilities for introductions to it, uh, advanced workshop possibilities, and then leading toward training possibilities. It was Robin's wonderful organized thinking that set that long-term set of goals. So I had been working as a private teacher here in New York in the years that Robin came to work with me here. So uh, Carl Stahl was also called Dr. Breath and his work was pretty, like he was a, he was a, a music teacher, but he was brought into hospitals to, I, what, to perform what I would call miracles, helping people heal from incurable uh, issues like emphysema, uh, COPD, things like that. And he was actually helping them re return to their lives and have a life. Um, how, how did you meet Carl Stow? Well, I will say that in a moment, but what, uh, what you just suggested, looking back at Carl's early, early work, even before I met him, what he gained in those early years, what he, what he came to was establishing a goal of practice uh, that he could offer to an individual student 
that would help to enhance the coordination of the diaphragm, the primary muscle of breathing in the human body, and bring into uh, an assistantship with the diaphragm as many as possible other muscles in the trunk area of the body that might assist the diaphragm in providing a steady, regular flow of air to the vocal mechanism for speaking and singing. And this improvement of the inflow outflow of air that he was able to bring about both by teaching and uh, a gentle hands-on work and listening to the person's voice. He was able to put together a way of practicing that would enhance the movement potential and the strength of the diaphragm in coordination with multiple other muscles on both the inhale and the exhale phase of the diaphragm's activity. That if is I, what he established. Robin. If I had a thought just to um, corroborate, I think that what Lynn hasn't said about what MDHBC is. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't answer that yet. Go ahead. It, it is, is because she brought something invaluable to it in the sense that as you said Stau had this intuitive genius that when he was working on someone he felt what part of the breathing mechanism was not being used to its full potential and so he was able to make people access that potential now just about pathologies just a word about pathologies mm -hmm. emphysema can't be cured so that means if you have emphysema on 60% of your lungs, you might be completely out of breath because your whole lung is a bit paralyzed by the feeling of the emphysema. But if your teacher teaches you to use the 40% of the lungs that is not affected, you might actually realize that all this time you could have had a very good quality of life, even though you had that, because you learned to use what you still have. And that is what Stau did. And the reason why he was not able, I believe, to establish a training in this, is that he was doing it through his extensive experience of optimal function in the breathing mechanism for singers that he had seen all of his life because he was a choir director. So he was faced with, imagine him having 200 choir members in front of him, seeing all these respiratory mechanisms working well. So he had developed a sort of an intuition of, what it is when it works well. And this is where he got a little bit stuck into how to replicate it. And Lynn, at the same time that she met Stau, she was also starting her studies in ideokinesis, which is a branch of functional anatomy. Now, functional anatomy is different than medical anatomy in the sense that medical anatomy is looking at bringing things back to the norm. If you have a broken arm, you're going to put a plaster, your bone is going to mend, you're going to be good, back to normal. Functional anatomy it aims for peak efficiency. And so it's the study of what or how structures could be used in a way that is optimal for those very structures. And so Lynn, throughout her work with Stau, used the ideokinetic methodology to analyze what she thought he was doing. And in doing that, when she shared with me her main hypothesis, she laid the fundamental grounds for this being replicable. And, and, and so I think that um, I don't want to answer for Lynn about how she met Stau, but I think that what I want to talk about is the incredible human being that Lynn is, because she, when she met Stau, she saw the diamond, and she understood, okay, I'm not going to get explanations directly from him because he doesn't, maybe he can't explain to me exactly how he does it. She stayed patiently with him. And she thought, okay, wait a minute. In ideal kinesis, I know this, this, and this, and this. And so perhaps what he's doing then is that he's touching this. Or, oh, perhaps he's influencing that muscle. And that I find the, the absolute genius and beauty of, of what you did, Lynn, in having so much dedication and respect for him for those 25 years, but yet also daring more and more, not hiding your light, 
and daring to say, oh, with what I know in ideokinesis, I think that what he's touching is actually, or the muscles he's influencing are those, those, and those, and those, which then allowed us coming further to start putting a logic to it and to make it more replicable. Yes. Ideokinesis is not a commonly known word. So just to take that apart for a moment, ideo, idea, an idea, a concept, a thought based on functional anatomy that influences kinesis, the sense of movement somewhere in the body. It has three elements that are very important to the success of it, and they are uh, the location in the human body of what will be moving and how, the direction of movement that could be possible, or directions of movement that could be possible, and then the action that you are hoping to improve upon. So it's all about thinking inside of the body, and that is certainly what Carl Stau was doing with and for each of us in those years. I also think that because, like my partner Robin, Carl had a very quick, fast moving mind, and he just went. You know, he, he couldn't, this is different because Robin can put the words around things, but Carl was not always able to wrap the words around what he saw that he wanted to do in working with a person. And because he was alone in his practice and development, he was free to uh, choose what direction he would take with each person, each hour that he worked each day. And so it was beautifully improvisational what he would do. Um, now, I'm not the only person who carefully studied uh, uh, my lesson and other people's lessons with him, trying to observe what he did most of the time. You know, what did he repeat whenever he did repeat something? And that's a part of what we've tried to bring in um, with Robin in, in the development of uh, MDH, breathing coordination, to add in specific elements that we believe that Carl was using in creating his hands-on technique. But we wanted to also have a, um, a verbal teaching process. Uh, I truly, truly believe that the owner of the structures should know something about what he wishes those structures to do. And you know, any level of explanation, whether it's common parlance, everyday speech, words, or fancy anatomy words, anything we can give a person to help them visualize in their own mind the kind of action they want to have result in movement in their bodies. And we've also brought in, and Robin is very good at this too, all kinds of toys to give demonstrations of actions of movement. This is my current favorite, this little toy that a five-year-old child suggested to me of equal even distribution of action everywhere. And it's a way that we think about the human body from the head down to the bottom of the pelvis, that central chamber of organized movement that supports the diaphragm in guiding air out of the lungs and helping to create the space for new air to come in. So certainly toys and examples, visual examples, demonstrations, have become part of what we use in our teaching. Back to you, Rob. I didn't mean to take the, all that time. I think what you're saying, Lynn, is that we need to reach a conceptual agreement with our students. What, yes. what you're saying is conceptual concepts can only be useful if they are really understood. You know, you could, could talk, we could talk about co-conceptualization, which is the way I've worded it in my book, that this, this idea of, of 
conceptual agreement that, that the concepts need to be understood in order for there to be replication. I think uh, if I had to summarize what we do in terms of our methodology, I would say conceptual agreement and assessment. In the sense we, we whatever we want to aim for, we explain in a clear manner that the person understands where we are going. And then we assess on that specific part of that person, if we're talking about what, how we want the leg to interact with the breathing, we're gonna explain the connection of, between the legs and the breath. And then we're gonna assess on that individual how he or she is expressing or using that specific part compared to our concept. So for me, conceptual agreement and assessment put together allow for a path that sort of avoids the risk of what you could call guruism. You know, this idea of having, I don't know if that's an English word, uh, but, but- I think uh, we can make it one. Yes, yeah, we just, we just <laughs> make it one. Uh, and, and, and that's why I love it, because if I can agree with, with a person on, oh, this is how we would like the legs to work when we breathe. And then, oh, right now, in your case, your legs are doing this, this, and that. And what we would like to, what they can offer you, what they want to do for you is that, that's in this. And then we can find ways and exercise and give also through touch and imagery um, a way to get there. Then it's about, oh, let me enjoy what my legs have to offer to me. It's not about, oh my God, this teacher is so incredible. You know, of course, our students respect us and we love that they respect us. Nevertheless, we manage, I find, to educate people in using their breath. And we, that allows us to not fall into a sort of, um, oh, this is my method, we are right, uh, and that it's not satisfactory to me intellectually. And, and there's a possible risk of, this is our method, you come, you come to us, and it seems as though, it could seem as though we do it for you. And that makes us something like um, the secret owners of the information. And we don't want to be the secret owners of any information. And um, I certainly don't think that Carl Stow had any idea of doing that, but it was not his way of teaching to offer a great deal of underlying background information to the way he did his work. And because he developed it, uh, one could say alone in splendid isolation. And um, he didn't have teachers teaching him. I mean, the medical people who had thought they would be able to help him couldn't help him. They couldn't improve on what he was already doing. So it was up to him to keep experimenting with it. And he worked improvisationally with each person. So uh, I, I, it was hard for me when I was the person who wanted him to teach me more about how he did what he did. But now looking back with, with well, a sense that I've come farther down that road, um, I can see why that was really difficult for him because nobody supervised him really. And, um, he was offered supervision from uh, medical professionals in the Veterans Administration hospitals where he started working, but um, they didn't really know how he was developing what he was developing, and they left him alone to do it, which on one hand was fabulous because he became brilliant at it, but on the other hand, he couldn't explain to them precisely how he did what he did. And that's the sleuthing. We're not alone in this. Others have cared and have looked at the subject as well. But Robin and I have been on this sleuthing mission from the beginning to articulate as many of the ideas that are used to promote what, we're called, what we all call breathing coordination as we possibly can to give them to the student for the student to use. So from, from an outsider, you know, you know, just looking in and it looks like you guys have developed a way to, 
to teach educators how to restore someone's life uh, through taking ownership of their breath and their voice. Well, that's a huge goal, and we would hope for that. We would hope for that, but we don't have a guarantee that an individual student will be able to take that full uh, ownership of his own life. But we wish to offer every morsel that we have. I mean, every grain of energy and brain power that we have separately and together to offer the possibilities of that. Well, just reading the, the stories in Robin's books, it looks like that that's, that's what you guys are doing. I'm sorry, Robin, I didn't mean to cut you off there. Well, um, what, I, what I was going to say is that, um, of course, it's not going to speak to everyone. I mean, that, of course, makes sense. But I've had hundreds of cases of people telling me, but Robin, the way I felt in the session with Lynn in, at the workshop, how she made me feel the fact that i my body could feel so good made me realize that i'm not in the right job or made me realize that i need to change the way i think about it, how i educate my children or i need to you know and and it's also been the case for lessons that they, they took with me that that they are with practitioners as well i hear a lot of comments about in, in other words, I think we are designed to breathe. And this is, this is a sentence that was uttered to me by one of our dear, dear, dear practitioner, Karen Sadek, who's incredible. Brilliant. And she said, aren't we designed to breathe? And I was like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so to me, it feels like when, when we are um, restoring the freedom of the breath flow, it has a huge impact on the, on the parasympathetic nervous system. This is this is quite well known about the stimulation of the vagus nerve and all of those things that, you know, I'm not a neurologist, I'm not going to go in details in that. But I believe that when your breath is really opening up, you realize how you would live if you didn't activate constantly your sympathetic nervous system and how you would be peaceful and how you would be happy and how, and I, and, and I remember one case where a guy actually didn't take it and he, he, he he told me at the end, he took one two hour session and he said to me at the end, Robin, if this is a state of peace and calm that I can live in, live in, it means my whole life has to change and I'm not ready for that. And he never came back. So, wow. so conversely to that, what Robin just described was quite precisely what I personally experienced the first day of my first session lesson with Carl Stow. I walked out into my city, which I love dearly, sailing down the avenues. And I just thought, I don't know what this is that just happened to me, but whatever it is, I want it. I didn't have the restraint of, you know, your Robin's example, a person who said, well, I'd have to change my entire life. I can't do that. I, I didn't think quite that far, but I absolutely thought, whatever this is, I want it and I'm going to pursue it and I'm going to do my best to get it. And anything I need to do, that's what I'm going to do. And well, I don't know, can we say I've been really successful? Who can be sure? But here we are, and um, I feel successful about it. That's, that's awesome. So Robin, I got a question for you. How, how important is the voice for someone's health? How are they related? Well, in our understanding, the voice uh, provides a resistance to the outflow of air. And um, we believe that when you emit a, a spoken sound, the, the airflow is stopped. Well, that, that is a fact. It's known that it's stopped by the voice. Our hypothesis is that as the voice does that, and it's based on Newton's law of motion, when you have a force in motion meeting a resistance, a force proportional to the resistance travels back down. And so we feel that whenever we use voice, 
there is a force in motion traveling back towards our body that is then opposing the ascending movement of the diaphragm. And we believe that this opposing uh, force is actually a stimulative element for the diaphragm in an eccentric contraction. So for, for those people who do a little bit of, of gym or you know they might know those terms, you know that when you do- um, We have an expert right here on the, on the screen with us. Oh, Go perfect. Ahead. That when you, you, know, you have a shortening contraction, it's concentric. When you are staying where you are, it's isometric. But if you are not releasing, but releasing whilst holding back, that is eccentric. And as the diaphragm travels upward in, in the, you know, inside us, as we uh, exhale, we feel that having the voice doing this resistance is acting like a stimulation that then helps the diaphragm travel higher up. Now, interestingly, because it is not a proven thing that the diaphragm is able of eccentric contraction, it is our hypothesis, it is interesting to know that the English National Opera just published a huge thing about um, opera singers helping patients of long COVID with breathing techniques and voice. And it appears that uh, this program has reported, I was reading this in the newspaper today, 90% of the participants suffering from long COVID symptoms have reported that following this program by the English National Opera, where they learn the breathing techniques and um, the way to use your voice as an opera singer. They don't give the details, but they have 90% report huge improvement. And so for me, it, it really corroborates that using your system well, in terms of breathing, can be promoted by using a resistance tool like for any other muscle. In other words, if you're going to go to the gym and you want to develop your muscle, you're going to need a resistance, you're going to need a weight. So in other words, the dumbbell for a very light dumbbell though, for the diaphragm could be the vocal cords. And if we work with like la 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 just like that, then it's going to send a pressure in that's going to stimulate um, its mobility. So I believe that that is the connection. And it is my understanding that of course, a healthy voice is good for communication, but, but also in terms of, of, of lung function, that it could have a positive impact. And many doctors actually are starting to agree with us. A key, key element of all that Robin just said, I feel, is that the resistant, the resisting element for this hypothesis of an eccentric lengthening contraction of the diaphragm is a system that is also in movement. It is not a static weight. It's not a 10 pound weight, although the heart and the lungs must have some weight that are moved by the diaphragm. But it's about the air and the movement of the vocal folds, which is, they just go on and on and on and on and on. They are a mobile resistance to what we're calling the eccentric lengthening contraction of the diaphragm. So it's a system that is fully in movement almost all the time. And, it's, and it's, a, it's a gentle kind of movement or we think voice should be that. Even if you are singing on the opera stage, there's the movement is ongoing of voice, Robin. Particular in terms of health because a healthy a voice will feed, will, will increase the diaphragm's ability, but when the diaphragm's ability is stronger, the voice is becoming healthier. Mm. Like, like we have so many people who come with vocal fatigue and when their diaphragm is retrained, the vocal fatigue goes away. And we believe that this is because improper balancing of this pressure coming back into the body makes it be sent back to the cords and create too much friction at the level of the vocal cords, which then encourages irritation. And so we feel that there's a really a um, virtual circle of healing between you know the voice promoting diaphragm and diaphragm promoting voice and all of that promoting general health mm -hmm. so i'm a i love i get fascinated with how the body's designed and how the nervous system always wants to 
to me, the nervous system's always wanting to be safe. Uh, and you talk about in, in your book, The Path of Vo to Voice, um, that it's important how, well, I'll just ask you, how important is it for a person to feel safe when they're trying to uh, find their breath and express their voice? Well, one of the components of the fight or flight reactions is a pulled inhale. It's a short pulled inhale. It's like that. And that, the hypothesis of neurologists on that in this fight or flight response is that it allows you to either fight, run away, or look dead. That, that when there's a predator, um, that the, the, the reaction is those three op types of, um, of actions that allow potentially the prey to survive. Now, this is perfect to run away. But the problem is that right now, when we express ourselves or when we use our voice, we are not facing a bear that's going to try to kill us. So running away, it's not going to help. Because as the voice is designed, it needs a small and steady outflow of air to be efficient. And that's the opposite of what's going to happen if you do a short cold inhale. And so I believe for me and that, well, seeing a little bit the, the path of the, the people that I see like opera singers in career or what, that there is a little bit of a confusion sometimes where People say, oh, well, the job is tough, so you have to be able to face anything tough. But I think when you work on your voice, you should be really in a safe environment where you don't feel judged or evaluated because you are actually acquiring a refined neuromotor skill. You're, you're working on, or even working on your breathing coordination, you're, you're acquiring what really can be called refined neuromotor skill in terms of refining and distributing an action how Lynn showed with her wonderful toy and so if in that moment you are act you are activating your fight or flight then you are going to go into reactions that are way less subtle and not allowing this equal even distribution of movement and so for me in my book I talk about neuro emotional coordination as well and how our nervous system needs a safe place and i believe that in the world of education in schools in you know there i mean there's been a lot said about anti-bullying and and i and I, I i respect that and i love that but i i feel like sometimes we need to take this discussion even further than anti-bullying we need to think okay how can we make it that the nervous system of the individuals that we are working with does not go into fight or flight and, and, and what does that mean? How does that mean in my interaction with those people in my, in, in connecting, in, in, in listening, in being, you know, in adapting myself to the people I see, you know, and, 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 and I think that the more we can create um, a safe space that is truly safe, in a sense, um, you know, it's not about the words. It's about the reaction of the nervous system. And so sometimes I see schools that implement safe space protocols where you'll have like, um, an, uh, I'm being negative here, but an uptight psychologist be like, okay, what's going on with you? But you don't feel safe at all to, to, to talk with her. And, and for me, the voice and the breath and actually any refine your motor skills uh, uh, ability or even the skill or concept should be learned or acquired in a context where we feel absolutely safe that we are not being not enough or not being you know and and um and that, that i find really crucial otherwise it fail, it's going there's going to be a failure in learning it's not going to be possible to actually learn because you will not be in the in the state that's going to allow integration of things and that that i, I find really really important and i'll i'll get back to you lynn i, I want to say that for me the way lynn changed my life is the first time I met her is in the first 20 minutes before I went on her um, table where she was going to do the assessment on me, the way she talked to me, I felt, and I encourage anyone who sees this to go see Lynn, to have a session with her as soon as she teaches in person again, because it's just mind-blowing. There are some people in this world, 
and she's the one that I know that does that the most, that have a way to truly desire you to be safe in whoever you are. And, and who, who truly, it's not about having learned a protocol that, oh, it's good to be safe, but that there's a, there's a truth in, in being, being with this other person and going to meet them where they are and as who they are. And that is to me where great teaching becomes possible because then the nervous system lets go. My, my, my muscular locks I had in my ribs, I was having a lot of you know, issues with my voice, but the reason also why they never let go with other teachers is that my nervous system never felt truly safe or not, never as safe as with Lynn. That to me has been, well, it has changed my life, literally. And I would have to look back, uh, not only to Carl Stow, also some other wonderful teachers I have known in my life, but that was something that was always present with Carl when he was the teacher, that he allowed me to feel totally safe every single moment. So that was a quality that he had. It just was part of him and, and how, he, uh, how he worked. Um, he had three parameters of, uh, I guess we could call them assessment uh, for his, a student uh, you know, throughout a session with him. He uh, was observing with his eyes, well, of course, how you looked, how movement was taking place in your body, either movement you were uh, carrying out on your own, and then movement that occurred when he used his hands to encourage movement in some of your body uh, areas related to breathing. And so he had always a visual assessment going on, an assessment of quality of movement that he would feel in his hands, which of course many excellent body work practitioners can also do, and his close to perfect ear for the resonating sound of human voice, which is the characteristic that Robin also has. I have worked hard to gain more of that particular uh, ability to assess the sound quality of human voice. I've learned so much from Robin about that, possibly more than I've learned anywhere else in my life. Uh, so that those parameters are always present and they have, as far as I'm concerned, been present this entire year of lockdown where I have taught only via Zoom since March of last year. And odd as it may sound, all three of those parameters can be felt through the Zoom screen. The assessment of the voice, the, the sense of calm that the person might be able to gain, um, even without the direct hands-on, uh, I can observe movement, even very subtle movement of the person's breathing mechanism. And there's a, a fairly good capability to hear qualities of the person's voice. And I think there's a word that I, I use, perhaps I overuse this word, but it's related to movement and the sound of voice. So two out of the three parameters that are possible in Zoom teaching, a sense of fluidity in the person's body. Can I see or hope for or try to deliver suggestions about fluid movement, especially in the body parts that play the most with breathing coordination? I would say from the balance of the head on the top of the spine to the very the balance points of the pelvis as we each sit on our chairs, uh, everything in between there needs to search for a sense of fluidity of movement and that fluidity of movement glides into the sound of connection of syllable to syllable of spoken words. And, uh, and Carl had all of that. It's taken us a few years to 
put it together, some of it, to put it into words. And um, I think that's a big part of how we're trying to go forward with our teaching of groups, just groups of people who are interested in the subject, individuals interested in the subject, and individuals who feel uh, a hope to also be trained. Can, can I ask you to a potentially easy yet controversial question? Sure. What, and you'll, when I ask you, and I, what, is, what is the perfect breath? Like, how long is it? Uh, is it timed? Is it, how does it feel? What does it look like? Is there a perfect breath? Um, ready, go. <laughs> I don't think there's a perfect timing about it, per personally. I think it's a personal timing. Um, Robin could sustain vocal sound much longer than I can. That doesn't make me a bad breather. I sustain a length of moving air. I think moving air is the quality. If there's air there in me, it should be moved by my structures smoothly, gently, and as fully as possible, either receiving the air flowing into me or my muscles organizing themselves to assist sending that air back out. Fluidity of movement. Um, the timing is each individual. I wanted to be the very best when I worked with Carl. I wanted my exhales to be as long as his, and they never were in his lifetime. They have been since. And to do a kind of uh, watching the second hand on the clock does not work well. And when I gave that up and dropped that goal, I think I really made the kind of improvisational progress that is a part of breathing coordination. That in my view, it's never going to be exactly the same length of time or amplitude of action over again. Mm, if I have to put it in my words, I would say that a, a perfect breath is adaptative. In the sense, it, it's an adaptation to the context. Mm -hmm. Are you, well, you could, you could call it a sort of an optimal and adaptive breath. Are you using your structures with a minimum effort for a maximum efficiency? at this given time. I'll give you an example. I was working on one of our nation's fastest runners. So he is a uh, um, elite runner guy. So um, we had to put him on a, on a treadmill. Because uh, of course I could never run behind him. He would be way too fast for me. <laughs> he really looks like, a, like a, an antelope when he runs. My goodness, it's incredible. It's like, doo -doo -doo, he's already there. Um, and um, so, we were looking at how he was using his breath while he was running. Now, of course, when you run, you're going to burn more air. It's going to need, you're going to have a much bigger turnover. So the outflow of air you would use is not the same as for singing, where you have to have a small and steady outflow of air. So there you have already one example of a perfect breath that doesn't exist. It's adaptive and optimal. Nevertheless, what we noticed is when he was running, the running was putting his head forward which was creating a sort of a leverage, which was inhibiting movement in the top three ribs in the back. So as I was placing my hands, what I was doing is I was placing my hands on him and I was trying to feel what ribs are moving and what are not. And I noticed that the upper three ribs in the back did not exhibit inhaling and exhaling patterns. So they were getting stuck. And then I made the hypothesis because they had not been stuck when we were working earlier lying down so I made the hypothesis that it was the head that was projected forward that was creating a sort of a muscular counterweight in some of the, maybe the rhomboid muscle, the trapezius a little bit, the intercostal muscles, external, probably something like that. All of same. So then what I did is I, re I brought his head back into alignment and he stopped running. And for a while I was doing manual, like hands-on pressure on these three top ribs to just get them back into movement. Then when they started back into movement, he started running. It was a little bit epic because imagine me, I was on a sort of a wood stool 
next to the treadmill, almost falling on him, like that on him. And he was running faster and faster and faster. And I was yelling to him, maintain the movement, maintain the movement. I mean, it, it was quite epic. Nevertheless, he did say, he, he did that for a few minutes and he did say, it's absolutely unbelievable. I'm running and I'm no longer out of breath. Wow. It, it, it's it's mind blowing. It's like, I've never felt that. It, if it can be so easy, I can make so much better timing. I can I can run. I will be able to reach much much higher, much better. He was he his mind was just. It was like, how is that? So you see, for me, the breath he did there had in common with my opera singers, even equal distribution of movements. But it did not have in common the timing, nor the quantities. And so to finish about what a optimal, what a perfect breath is, what I can tell you is when Lin really um, managed to get me there into a very long exhale by guiding my ribs and I could exhale further, 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 I felt at the very end, almost like an inner cathedral. Like I felt something incredibly peaceful, like a peace that I had never truly felt before. And I felt completely serene and I didn't know when the next inhale would happen. So there was no, not at all a tightness of and then inhale. It was very, very long, but as the structures were doing their job, distributing the movement, none of my muscles was getting into a cramp or, or tightness. And I felt completely peaceful. And in, in the middle there, like a sparkle or something, new air came in and it felt like I was receiving new life again. And, but it, it was, it was so perfect breath for me feels not labored, feels not effortful, feels not hard. It, it's just like a gift. You, you are, you have accepted to exhale, to expire, and then new life is brought back into you up to the moment of your death. Something like that, if, if I had to explain it. I couldn't agree more. So the perfect breath is, is new life. Um, I think that was that was amazing. That was awesome. Yeah, I guess you can say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's true. Nice way to put it. But the timing, the, the timing, the flow, the fluidity is an improvisation every time, and that is one of the messages that Carl Stow left for me. That stays with me again and again and again, right here, as we're trying to describe uh, what we've taken in putting this work together. Uh, it's an improvisation between the teacher and the student every time. Dude. And based on assessment. Based on assessment. It's but not you still don't know what will happen on the next round. <laughs> so I, I guess then if it, I, you'll have to tell me, is there, based off of what you know, and say there are people listening at home, what is one take home practical, uh, practical thing someone can do to start their journey to developing optimal breath or to restoring their voice or restoring their diaphragm? Mine would be when in doubt, breathe out. <laughs> Complete the exhale smoothly, gently, fully, and then allow the inhale to return it to you. And in the same vein, but maybe a little bit more in practical idea. Oh, go ahead. I love to work, like if I have to give a very simple advice, I work to, I love to work with either a silent syllable or a, a, a consonant could be like a very small hiss that you should not really hear. So like, of course you're gonna hear me because I'm gonna do it louder so that it goes through the camera, but like, like that. But now imagine doing it three times more quiet. Like that. And as you do that, you're going to do very gentle movements, just like swaying with your spine, super gentle. And you're going to continue that small hiss like that, or it could be a small F, 
or sometimes people like to do like silent as you were saying la 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 so i'm going to do it way too loud like but much quieter so we don't have too much airflow so completely quiet just the tongue flipping and you do it you 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 if you're not sure you're exhaling go to the hiss because then you're sure you're exhaling you only do it as long as it's absolutely comfortable if your hiss is two seconds and then you inhale you inhale and then the consecutive inhale is silent you receive the air if you need to sigh you sigh if you need to go ah, okay fine but in general we're looking for silent inhale so silent inhale followed by a long hiss as long as comfortable whilst gentle movement of the spine in order to stimulate mobility in the ribs. I find the easiest thing to do for anyone that is not causing, in my knowledge, any risk and that people can get um, something positive from. Mm -hmm. Another quick way that I sometimes offer is no muscular pull on the inhale and no muscular push on the exhale, but there is motion. Yeah. Yeah, because it's all internal muscles, really. When we work well, the, that, that's when you see good singers, you see they are not straining. And so they're not using outer muscles to, to actually do those incredible things. It's all sort of reflexive internal musculature that, that responds, like responsive, I would say. And that, that to me, how the, how the body is so incredible that it, that it, it's designed to do that for us. So when we strain, we actually are taking the wrong road. I would say all of the muscles that primarily participate in breathing coordination, starting with the diaphragm, are invisible and untouchable from the outside. Yeah. Therefore, the idea, the concept, the idea could be implanted. Never awesome. going to, I'm never going to touch a living diaphragm that I know of. <laughs> yep. Guys, uh, thank you so much for sharing your time and your knowledge with me. This is this has been really a, a great conversation, and I've learned a lot. And I'll be I'll be swaying in the wind as I hiss, um, yeah. and I'll let you know how that goes. <laughs> I'm getting new life. That's right. I'm going to be getting new life. <laughs> I love it. Guys, thank you so much for listening to this week's edition of the Original Strength Podcast. Thanks for listening, everyone. Have a great weekend.